My talk tonight draws on my ongoing research into the history of efforts to preserve genetic diversity in crop plants, especially the world's many distinctive varieties of food crops. So maize, for example, potatoes, rice, broccoli, so on. You can imagine the, 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 the thousands of possibilities here. Um, for many plants and in many places, this genetic diversity is conserved chiefly as seed samples. Seeds sourced from farms around the world, seeds which are typically set aside in storage to await some future need. And my talk starts, as many uh, talks about uh, putting seeds in storage do, on the Arctic island of Svalbard. Here, in the 1980s, the Nordic Gene Bank established a storage facility for crop seeds in a coal mine. The idea was to create a safe site for storing a duplicate copy of the Nordic Gene Bank's base collection. That is, its collection of seed samples slated for long-term conservation. This long-term conservation collection was already at that time being maintained in Alnarp, Sweden. The Alnarp base collection, in turn, itself consisted chiefly in duplicates. In this case, duplicates of a number of so-called active collections that were in regular use by scientists in Nordic countries. A proposal to create a second Arctic seed storage facility, this one for broader international use, followed shortly after the creation of the Nordic Svalbard storage facility. And this proposal for a second facility remained in development through the 1990s. This second facility, eventually named the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, was opened in 2008. Seed conservation centers around the world have since been encouraged to deposit copies of their collections in this facility uh, for additional safekeeping. Today, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is uh, described as the final backup, or sometimes the ultimate backup, of the world's seed collections. As I'll describe today, it represents the endpoint of a technical recommendation of what's called safety duplication, a process that most of us here would understand and describe today as backup. This strategy of safety duplication has been pursued by the crop genetic resources community since the 1970s. Many seed banks that have contributed to the Svalbard Global Seed Collection were, at the time that it opened, already duplicating their collections for security, just as the Nordic Gene Bank uh, was doing. Meaning that whatever they sent to Svalbard would be a further duplicate of collections already duplicated, one or multiple times. Now, most analyses of the seed vault by historians and social scientists, of which there are many, people really like to attend to, to this vault and what it's doing, um, but, but many of those analyses zero in as cold, on coldness as a way to understand the vision of security that it offers. So for example, a recent analysis offers the seed vault as an archetypical example of something called cold optimism, Quote, an instantiation of the belief that death can be postponed indefinitely through practices of low temperature preservation. Others emphasize that the security achieved through freezing is amplified at the vault by the physical remoteness of the site, by the geopolitical status of its host country. Photographs like this one um, uh, suggest an unpeopled ice-bound fortress. Descriptions present a placid Norway, somehow outside of politics, immune to the kinds of power struggles that destabilize other countries. I agree with those analyses. Uh, it's clear that coldness, that remoteness, that Nordicness are essential to the security for seeds that is promised 
by the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. But these aspects are distinct and, as I will describe in this talk, secondary to the feature of the vault that really serves as its main claim to effective long-term conservation, and that is duplication. Even when they're frozen, seeds will inevitably decay and die in storage. So without a field in the right kind of environment and a farmer with the right kind of knowledge in order to regrow the seeds, both of which, I should point out, uh, just in case it's not already obvious, are pretty improbable on Svalbard. Uh, without those things, passive freezer storage is security with an extended but a still finite horizon. And this means that in order for the vault to realize security, its passive possession has to be complemented by active maintenance, use, and circulation of seeds. It can only ever be a backup a site from which to restore copies, but not to warehouse originals. We therefore need to understand this element of the security offered at Svalbard. What kind of security does a copy promise? And what does it actually accomplish? Answering these questions is crucial because unlike coldness and remoteness, Safety duplication is absolutely consistent across the operation of the global infrastructure for conserving crop diversity. Not all crop collections can have their natural lifespans extended through freezing, although admittedly, scientists are really trying hard to make that the case. Not all seed banks are remote, although as we'll see, remoteness has sometimes been uh, a desideratum. By comparison, seed and other genetic samples are rarely, if ever, considered adequately conserved today, especially for the long term, unless they have also been copied. So to better understand how and why this came to be the case, I'm going to share with you two key historical episodes in the history of seed banking. The first is the creation of the United States National Seed Storage Laboratory in the 1950s and its development thereafter. And the second is the establishment of a global network of gene bank base collections via the work of the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources and successor institutions in the 1970s and 80s. And there are two different elements that I want to highlight in these histories. A first is the shift in the metaphor used to explain the operation of long-term conservation collections for crop diversity. A shift from that of banking to that of backup. And the second element that I'd like to call attention to is the changing assessments made over time uh, of duplicate accessions, that is, samples of what are assumed to be genetically identical materials. As I'll discuss, duplicates transitioned from being a definite no within uh, uh, conservation systems to a sometimes irritating but definitely unavoidable part of the seed banking system to an element that was considered simultaneously essential and at the same time threatening to effective conservation. Telling this history, uh, that is to say, the history of the consolidation of duplication as the go-to strategy for long-term conservation of genetic diversity in crop plants offers an opportunity to reflect more generally on the history of backup as a Cold War compulsion turned into a cheap fail-safe for a neoliberal age. It also calls attention to the hazards of safety duplication, the hazards of backup, that is, the hazards of establishing conditions for security that valorize copying as a solution rather than addressing the root causes of insecurity. I'm going to come back to those thoughts uh, at the end of the talk. In December 1958, the Colorado State University News announced the opening of a new facility on the university's campus, the Fort Knox of the seed world. This was the recently completed U.S. National Seed Storage Laboratory, a U.S. Department of Agriculture facility. It had been tasked with making sure that the seeds, the valuable seeds brought into the country from abroad 
or created by the nation's breeders would remain safe and available to users in perpetuity. And that really explains, in part, the reference to Fort Knox. Fort Knox was another name for the United States Bullion Depository, the storage facility for the US's gold reserves. The Bullion Depository shared its name with the adjacent army post that contributed to its perceived security. Now, the substantial gold reserves at Fort Knox, essential to the country's well-being, were well defended. The seeds uh, uh, in, stored in the Fort Collins Laboratory, the new seed storage laboratory, would also be protected in order to sustain agricultural productivity. Fort Collins, the home of the new seed storage facility, was a city and not a military base like Fort Knox. But the facility was, as I will describe, very much built uh, like a bunker. Yet the military comparison was not the important one that was being made in the gesture to Fort Knox. It was financial metaphors that had run rampant in the years of lobbying that preceded the 1956 congressional appropriation for the National Seed Storage Laboratory to be established. Advocates for the facility maintained that existing crop seed collections, which were run by government employees and supplied by plant breeders with biological materials that their work required, were like the, quote, cashier's windows of banks where funds are received and paid out. The only difference was that the managers of seed collections were seriously hampered in comparison to a typical bank cashier. Without the capacity for long-term storage, collection managers had to continually decide what to save and what to discard. And they typically did that only with short-term interests in mind. As advocates of a national seed storage facility repeatedly maintained, these scientists must operate a bank without a reserve vault for funds. The laboratory at Fort Collins would be that vault, um, that vault for reserve funds. And the seeds within it uh, would be the reserve supply on which other seed collections and the breeders who use those collections and ultimately the US farmers who wanted ever better crop varieties could always depend. Although officially designated as a seed storage laboratory, the Fort Collins facility would be more often described as a seed bank or else as a germplasm bank or a gene bank, as are many equivalent institutions around the world today, even though this metaphor is all but dead. Agricultural administrators and scientists in the United States had actually been agitating for a facility like this, for better seed storage facilities in general, since at least the early 1940s. Some had been concerned that older crop varieties were disappearing, increasingly replaced by breeders uh, smacking fine uh, improved varieties, uh, different kinds of crops and vegetables that were brought to market by professional breeders. They, they, uh, this was a problem that, that might arise for future breeders if those older varieties were replaced, uh, because breeders might need that wider selection of genetic starting materials in order to address new agricultural needs. The concern about the loss of older varieties as they were replaced by newer ones was compounded by the observation that even though the United States had sponsored many, many plant exploration missions since the 19th century, successfully introducing into the country hundreds and thousands of plants as seeds and other materials, most of these collected materials were discarded if no immediate use were found for them. So the advocates of a prospective national seed storage laboratory saw this institution as a way to stem the tide of losses. Old varieties could be kept extant even if nobody was growing them. Breeders could just hand over less immediately useful materials from their collections, saving themselves the, the energy and the time required to keep these viable with the assurance that they would nonetheless still be available in the future. When the National Seed Storage Laboratory finally opened in 1959, its chief responsibilities were in organizing seeds in refrigerated storage, germinating them at regular intervals to assess their continued viability, and finally, arranging for the provision of a fresh supply of seed 
typically to come from the original donor of the seed whenever the viability of stored samples was found to be below acceptable thresholds. Reflecting its mandate to keep seeds safe and a Cold War context that fostered safeguards against doomsday scenarios, the National Seed Storage Laboratory was designed to resist certain external threats. It was uh, located far from sites that were thought to be likely targets of nuclear attacks, but at the same time built to resist these. It also had elaborate standby equipment like generators and extra refrigerators. It kept multiple copies of essential documentation in the event of floods or fire, inadvertently damaging those. What it did not duplicate was seeds or the effort of maintaining those seeds. In fact, its organizers were adamant that it would do neither of these things. As promoters assured the US Congress in the 1950s, the laboratory would keep only one small package of each variety and would in no sense duplicate existing seed storage. The National Seed Storage Laboratory, as initially imagined, was not a place for storing copies. It was actually not that unlike the Boolean depository to which it was often compared. It was a secure repository for valued materials not in ordinary circulation. Working collections, that, are, that is to say those collections that were in active use by researchers of various kinds, those typically didn't need to be sent to the laboratory. And they worked, as they weren't thought to be in any danger from neglect. This remained the status quo for about a decade. In the 1970s, the US Department of Agriculture changed its vision for how the National Seed Storage Laboratory would ensure the long-term viability of diverse plant genetic materials, materials that were now increasingly known to many agricultural scientists, as they are today, as genetic resources. A handful of administrators and scientists expressed concern that most breeders and, and researchers working with plant collections in the United States were neglecting tasks relevant to preservation. Uh, ditto for agricultural experiment stations or public universities that employed those researchers. In the face of a general apathy about staying on top of working collections and uh, the needs of, of, of maintenance and keeping those up, the National Seed Stor Storage Laboratory was actually limited in the kinds of long-term security that it could honestly offer. One of the chief recommendations for how to fix this scenario uh, represented a distinctly new perspective on the function of the duplication of seeds within the facility, one in which this was no longer an unwanted, potentially costly redundancy, but instead sought after security. The deliberate copying of whole collections, perhaps even to more than one additional location, would be increasingly deemed essential for seeds long-term safekeeping and survival. Within a decade, this new understanding had reshaped the purpose and the practices of the US National Seed Storage Laboratory. The Fort Knox of Seeds had begun its transition to a new set of guiding metaphors. No longer that of safeguarding a reserve supply, but instead providing redundant capacity a feature referred to in contemporary communications and military circles as backup. So this change, this change in US policies on seed storage reflected a changed international landscape as much as uh, uh, changing national policies and practices. So I'm now gonna turn to concerns about seed security beyond the United States. For nearly 100 years, uh, a little bit more, plant explorers and breeders had called attention to the possible loss of useful crop diversity, including types that were maintained by farmers and crop wild relatives uh, as well. As I mentioned a bit earlier, this worry about the loss of older varieties, the displacement of, of farmers' varieties and other types by breeders and varieties. And, that, and that's what I'm referring to here. European agricultural experts had also managed in some cases, just as in the United States, to institute large state collections for gathering and retaining access to this diversity. 
They had also called for the creation of conservation-oriented collections and for international coordination of all these activities. And it was this last call in particular uh, that, went, that went largely unheeded. It wasn't until the 1960s, the late 1960s, that calls for internationally coordinated conservation finally produced a response. This came um, as a result of many shifts, um, but one of the most important was the so-called green revolution in, in uh, agriculture, a transformation in crops and farms and modes of agricultural production in South Asia, Latin America, and the Near East in the 1950s and 60s. The green revolution was linked to the widespread adoption of new crop varieties, especially wheat varieties initially developed in Mexico and rice from the Philippines, varieties that were considered to be um, unusually high yielding. It was also linked to the industrialized modes of production that were essential to realizing those high yields. Experts insisted that the spread of impressive new high yielding varieties would irreversibly diminish the diversity of crop species and ultimately constrain the possibilities of future agricultural development in crops as essential as rice, as wheat, as maize. They urged new collecting missions that would locate endangered crop diversity in various sites around the world and the creation of new conservation storage facilities and conservation institutions. But that wasn't all that they insisted on. When experts gathered in the late 1960s to assess the state of seed conservation worldwide and to make recommendations on how to protect the genetic resources that they now understood to be gravely endangered, they discovered that it wasn't just varieties in the field, those farmers' varieties that were soon to be displaced by green revolution wheat or, or rice, for example. It wasn't just those varieties that was in danger, that were in danger, sorry. The scientists were also shocked by the poor state of existing collections, which claimed to be conserving seed and by the general lack of attention given to the maintenance of seeds, maintenance that was, of course, essential to their long-term survival. One prominent plant scientist who was tasked with assessing the state of collections worldwide lamented that even where substantial efforts have been expended on collection, in many instances, the resulting material has been reduced by selection, depleted for economic or administrative reasons, or dissipated through loss of interest or inadequate maintenance. There is only scant information on the content and the standing of existing collections. At the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, experts shared distrust of typical collection management practices. The distrust that was evident in, in quotations like this one led them to champion new protocols for conservation and also greater international oversight of conservation activities. In this new imagined system, the facilities worldwide that were deemed to be most secure, um, uh, the superior facilities for seed storage, would be enrolled in an FAO-led network. And these superior facilities would agree to store certain seeds on behalf of FAO, with these scattered collections then together uh, creating an internationally governed long-term conservation collection, one that would be accessible to all global users. Given that they were also observing uh, significant shortcomings in conservation management and maintenance, the architects of this new seed conservation network also instituted system-wide fail-safes. Specifically, they required the duplication of seed samples as a form of insurance against mismanagement, uh, insurance against mismanagement and loss of seeds as a result. In fact, I think it's safe to say that their vision of security depended less on international governance and more on this strategic copying of seeds. In their recommended uh, system, scientists' working collections, renamed active collections, were to be duplicated in long-term conservation collections, which were now distinguished as base collections. The duplicate seeds kept in the latter would not ordinarily used, be used directly. So, for example, 
Um, they wouldn't uh, be distributed to researchers who requested them or made available for other purposes, but instead would supply the active collections from which routine multiplication and distribution would then uh, take place. A key purpose of base collections, kept in ideal conditions and minimally disturbed, was to limit the exposure of those seeds to biological reproduction, which threatened their genetic integrity in various different ways. The duplication of all active collections in stable base collections would be accompanied by further duplication. Conserved material, right, which is to say the material that was to be uh, secured in base collections, would also be duplicated in a process that was eventually described as safety duplication. So here, with safety duplication, the expectation was that any institution with a base collection would make a complete copy of this collection and then arrange for its storage elsewhere. This precaution would mitigate against catastrophic events, things like floods and fires and wars, any of which might wipe out a collection in a single stroke. From 1974, international seed conservation efforts, so things like collecting, cataloging, conservation exchange, these were coordinated by a new institution, the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources. Uh, and the International Board really endeavored to put all of these different uh, recommendations and expectations uh, in motion. The board invited a number of national and regional institutions to hold what it called world-based collections, that is, it invited them to be the designated global repository for seeds of a particular crop or, or particular crop species. For institutions who accepted, becoming part of a world-based collection implied holding an aggregate duplicate of all the world's collections for a specific subset of crops. Thanks to the wariness of funders about the costs of keeping collections and uh, the understandable sense of work proliferating across institutions, the International Board remained vigilant about uh, uh, attending to redundancy. However, this wariness really applied chiefly to labor of collecting, uh, to programming, um, and uh, the kinds of activities they were carrying out, and not to seeds and collections. By the mid-1970s, the only duplication of seed samples in collections that was seen to be a problem was careless regeneration or multiplication of seed stocks, that messy biological reproduction I, I mentioned that was always a worry. Untouched copies of seed samples safely stored were the bedrock the, of the nascent system's uh, promised security. You recognize this security strategy. Uh, you do it every day. Uh, you do it as a near moral imperative of modern life. You back things up. Uh, I, I know that you do. All of us do. Uh, historians and media studies scholars trace the roots of 21st century digital backup culture to the Cold War. Fears of nuclear attack on key institutions created conditions conducive to the dispersal and the vaulting of carbon copies. Uh, carbon copies, for example, of documents considered essential for recreating normal life, everything from uh, the Declaration of Independence in the United States to, to the records of banks and other uh, institutions. Infrastructural redundancy was also prioritized in military operations. Missile defense systems in the United States demanded not only redundant generators, but also identical computers working in tandem, each one replicating the capacity of the other. As NASA undertook manned space travel, its engineers provided substitutable versions of nearly every aspect of the mission, including, of course, the astronauts uh, themselves. And I think perhaps most salient for understanding the developing seed conservation network of the 1970s, when engineers began developing survivable com communication systems for the US military, they sought distributed systems in which the loss of a single node or even several nodes would not disrupt communication. This meant, among other features, ensuring that each node in the network was connected to multiple others, 
1964 design for a system of highly connected nodes transmitting information through a mode later described as packet switching. This is an operation adopted in the earliest uh, internetworks and, and foundational, obviously, to today's internet. Uh, these networks envisioned primary links between nodes, as well as backup links and second backup links, as you can see in the diagram here. A genetic resources network constituted in part through deliberate duplication reflected the increasing prominence of this Cold War approach to security. Although they had not yet adopted the language themselves, the scientists planning and overseeing the creation of an emergent network of world-based collections, later uh, described, as you can see here, as a global network of gene banks, were envisioning duplication in collections in much the same way that engineers were envisioning the backup elements being built into contemporaneous defense and communication systems. I'll just give you one example of this. An official handbook on the design of seed banks prepared in 1976, described how duplicate collections of base collections for long-term conservation are housed for security in different locations from corresponding base collections. Although the handbook recommended that the original base collection be sited uh, as far as possible in a socially stable area within reach of security personnel, that it be put on solid high ground, unlikely to quake or flood, and so on, even the most careful of site selection could not guarantee survival. So the handbook reminded seed bank designers that duplicate collections maintained elsewhere were needed as the ultimate insurance against accidental loss. The US National Seed Storage Laboratory was among the first facilities to be identified as possessing the right mechanical and the right managerial infrastructures to house one of these world-based collections. The US laboratory's integration into the international network hastened its adoption also at the national level of the language of active and base collections, along with the practices of duplicating samples for security. So as you can see here in the mid-1970s, administrators and scientists in the US Department of Agriculture reconceived the National Seed Storage Laboratory as a base collection. It would serve a US network of institutions, uh, researchers, plants and seeds, newly dubbed the National Plant Genetic Resources System. Now, as the rise of networked security grew, the appeal of banked security plummeted. The 1970s saw rising interest rates, successive oil shocks in 1973 and 1979, deregulation of banks, and the first major bank failures since World War II. In the United States, Americans' uncertainties about the reliability of the banking system were cemented in the 1980s as the so-called savings and loan crisis unfolded, with small banks closing by the hundreds. Even the vault at Fort Knox now seemed irrelevant, uh, with the United States having abandoned the gold standard in 1971. The crop genetic resources community soon experienced its own banking crisis, a seed banking crisis, of course. Even as researchers and administrators who were keen on conservation had celebrated the apparent successes of this new global network of gene banks, and with it the duplication of seeds from places and institutions seen as insecure into seed storage facilities that were judged to be state of the art, this process of copying and storing to remote locations came under attack. A growing community of activists linked the sequestration of seeds uh, into well-resourced facilities, into gene banks, uh, which were chiefly located in the US or Europe or under the control of uh, northern institutions, to a long history of imperial exploitation. Their critique suggested that a world network of gene banks was best understood as a means of securing pirated copies rather than safety duplicates. A subsequent fight over the control of seeds at the international level brought new scrutiny to seed banks. Reports soon compiled 
once again many shortcomings of these storage facilities. Broken refrigerators, lost samples, restrictions on access. Even champions of the existing network structure had to acknowledge that the putative successes of gathering many thousands of, of seed samples of varieties considered to be threatened in the 1970s and 80s had created a significant influx of materials to conserve and that this had, had actually multiplied the labor needed in processing, monitoring, evaluating samples, demands that had not been matched by increased funding and other capacities. In this context, a surfeit of duplicate samples met potentially a waste of precious resources and a threat to successful conservation. And there were many duplicate samples. Not just the deliberate duplicates generated by following the protocols for active collection, base collection, and um, safety duplicate uh, creation. There were also many genetically identical samples, duplicates, circulating unknowingly within a single seed bank's collection under different names, or circulating knowingly across institutions where seeds had been shared uh, and then been entered permanently into more than one gene bank collection, or they were circulating unknowingly across institutions where databases had not kept careful track of where seed originated, or where names had been translated and no longer corresponded to the original, uh, and so on. A 1984 study of seed bank conservation generated in the midst of these crises about whether seeds were being kept safe in seed banks determined that at least 50% of seed samples in global conservation collections were duplicates of material saved elsewhere. And it identified this as being a big problem. Indiscriminate duplication of entire collections at numerous gene banks is costly and unnecessary, with collections here being a reference to specific seed samples. Redundant duplicates within the same gene bank are undesirable. A view of duplication as costly and dangerous pointed towards a procedure that an increasing number of crop conservation specialists espoused from the mid-1980s onward. This was the rationalization of collections. Rationalization would involve, among other things, the elimination or reduction of some kinds of duplicate samples, both within collections and also across them. So rationalization didn't aim to eliminate safety duplicates or other intentional copies made in the interest of security, but instead to eliminate all those other duplicates, especially the ones unknowingly made and often hidden from view. In some cases, rationalization also aimed to reduce copies kept knowingly at multiple different institutions as part of their main active collections, and to achieve this largely by attempting to coordinate who would be responsible for what sample. Bringing down the overall number of samples kept in collections by reducing the number of duplicates would reduce the cost of keeping collections, the cost of generating data about those collections, uh, and uh, of course, the cost of backing them up effectively through safety duplication. Now, before the advent of cost-effective, rapid genetic identification via molecular techniques, it proved challenging, if not actually uh, straight out impossible, to know if presumed duplicate samples were actual genetic duplicates and could therefore be safely removed from a collection even when potentially identified. Nonetheless, in an institutional environment that was increasingly shaped by demands for efficiency and for utility, and with a sharp corresponding decline in aid donations to international agricultural research institutions, this ominous cloud of unwanted and unidentifiable duplicates being maintained at public expense in conditions of constrained uh, resources would not dissipate. Unwanted, unintentional, and excessive duplications were identified as a problem in both the first and second FAO reports on the state of the world's plant genetic resources for food and agriculture in 1997 and 2010. These are core documents for international policymaking uh, in this arena. Uh, 
And in a novel twist, the 2010 report also identified over safety duplication as a potential source of unnecessary expense as well. Too many items had been backed up too many times. In other words, concerns about too much duplication in general ultimately cast safety duplication, intentional backup for security, into shadow too. And it did so even as the Svalbard Global Seed Vault opened for deposit in 2008, promised to take this kind of duplication to the next level. So we've arrived back at Svalbard. Uh, in the 50 years or so from the creation of the National Seed Storage Laboratory to the opening of Svalbard, the metaphor used to explain the activity of long-term seed conservation shifted. Although the once dominant comparison to the cashier's window of the local savings and loan bank, or indeed the secure vaults of the Gold, Fort Knox Gold Reserve, live on in the metaphor seed bank, the most common meaningful metaphor for explaining what the world's major long-term conservation seed collections do is backup. And that's because the practices of conservation shifted. Seed storage facilities and the people who operated them, they were initially seen as the safeguards against loss. But when these institutions and individuals were routinely left without the resources necessary for their work, security was increasingly vested in copies rather than in institutional capacities. In the age of cloud computing, we consider backup cheap. It's a task that requires individual or, or perhaps institutional discipline rather than a significant financial outlay. As such, it seems like a suitable strategy for collections and curators as well. Seeds, just like computer files, are vulnerable to loss, but apparently cheap to copy. So we back up seeds, and then we back up the backups. Is there a problem with this? The worries about duplication within the seed banking system itself suggest that there might be. And that shouldn't surprise us. We already know, I think many of us, that copies are troublesome. Consider all the problems of paper and electronic duplicates, right? The sources of pirated knowledge, the vehicles of espionage, the means of identity theft. Even good copies can cause problems. Backup paper copies stored in remote vaults often became out of date in storage, necessitating elaborate information management systems so that storage did not become its own form of annihilation. The transition to digital has, if anything, intensified uh, these concerns about the longevity of informational archives given the rapid turnover of software and hardware systems. Meanwhile, strategists who have assessed policies of deliberate institutional or infrastructural redundancy, typically in, uh, instated as means of enhancing security, uh, have revealed that they often, in fact, create new possibilities for accidents. Creating duplicate capacity makes a system appear more secure and therefore also encourages greater risk taking. Many of the issues, the political and the social issues identified with respect to paper, digital, and mechanical copies also apply in the case of seeds. Fears of biopiracy, data management woes, overconfidence in technical, technical systems, in this case, agro-technical systems. The environmental costs of backup raises further concerns, I think, about copying. The data centers that constitute the ostensibly ethereal realm of cloud computing are in fact hot, expansive, power hungry. A home or office computer that's already backed up to a local hard disk in order to mitigate normal computer failures and subsequently copied to the cloud to secure it from less ordinary catastrophes like flood or wildfire contributes to the likely intensification of those same physical threats via its ever-growing carbon footprint. 
The effect of seed duplication on environmental sustainability is also potent. As I've described, concerns about the costs of unknown duplication in seed storage facilities drives this kind of perverse situation, I think perverse at least with respect to the stated goal of keeping biological diversity extant. It drives a situation in which the successful reproduction and dispersal of that diversity is also seen as a threat to its ultimate survival. It's a strange kind of biodiversity conservation that doesn't celebrate, I think, this, the, the dispersal and amplification of diversity from one location to another. As I read it, the proliferation of uh, backups and seed conservation indicates that our obsession with making and safeguarding copies produces only an elusive security. So when the inevitable call arrives, as I think it surely will, for a backup of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault as a result of, uh, say, the hazards of a melting permafrost, perhaps we can and should respond by demanding a new guiding metaphor for seed conservation and the practices that accompany it. There are different options that are already in circulation, the most common of which is that of the seed library. Uh, we might think of a vegetable sanctuary, other kinds of um, uh, ways of encompassing the work of conservation. Alternatively, we might want to reinvest in the metaphor and practice of banking. Not the impersonal, unregulated, cloud-based banking of today, but banking as it was idealized the moment that the modern seed bank was born. We might ask for a brick and mortar institution situated in and serving the community, but supported and overseen by larger state infrastructures. Not just taking in deposits for the long term, but continually redeploying these as loans with the understanding that the circulation of valuable materials and mutual trust and dependency can also provide security. Thank you. <laughs>